Welcome, 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 everybody. Welcome to AI for Humans, your weekly guide to the world of generative artificial intelligence. I'm Gavin Purcell, and we are here to demystify the world of AI. That is Kevin Prayer. He is my friend. He is my co-host. Kevin, how are you today? Delighted to be your friend and your co-host, Gavin. What a massive <laughs> That's so exciting. week in artificial intelligence. I've put on the flippers. I now have sunscreen applied. I got the hey. goggles. We're ready to dive in to the wet and wild no. world that is artificial intelligence. Were I, you waiting for me to do something there? No. Was that, were you waiting for something? I was hoping something better than wet and wild <laughs> would come to my head, and it certainly didn't, so I'm sorry. Let's drown together. On our show today, Google has gone woke. Oh and they're God, about this story is insane. to go this is an broke. Insane story. That's right, oh, no. baby. Get woke, get broke. We're going to explain the Gemini-generated outrage that is taking over the AI world. And also, it's not the entire story. Listen, this is a big story this week, and there's a lot of layers to it. You may think you know the whole thing, but you don't. So we're going to dive deeper into it. That's right. Plus, we'll have the latest in robot walking. That's, that's the whole tease. We're talking robots that walk. And it's more exciting than that. There's really a lot there, Gavin. A whole bunch to unpack. <laughs> fair no, enough, no, fair no. enough. We also are excited to have our guest today, my old buddy Diallo Riddle, who's a, a writer, a producer, part-time DJ. He's been DJing for a long time and also now a podcaster. He's a great podcast called One Song, where he deconstructs songs by, based on different aspects of their production and their layers. He is here to talk about... AI with us. And Diallo is somebody who I've known for a while, and I'm pretty excited to have him on the show. He is going to have a lot of insight into the world of music AI, and we're going to play around with Suno with him, and, and I think show it to him for the first time, oh, which will be super fun. I love that. What a treat. We're also going to do some really dumb demos with cutting-edge AI. We're going to crack some secret languages with our pal Pi. But before we get to that, Gavin, it's time to beg and plead. <laughs> Well, we're so good at this now. We're so good at this. If you're out there and you're listening to this and it's your first time, thank you so much. We appreciate it. But we have a job for you and everybody that's a longtime listener. You always have to go and tell somebody about the show. The way podcast grows is by telling somebody else about the show that exists. If you have fun listening to us, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We will read them at the end of the show. Leave us a like or subscribe to us on YouTube. If you're on our TikTok, comment on there. Just do whatever you can wherever you are for us. That's all we ask. Yes, because we love you when, when you, you love, love us. us. When you love yeah. us. Yeah. Oh, and also an important note, we had a weird moment this week where there was another podcast that attempted to kind of hijack our name briefly. It has changed that name, thankfully. But just make sure if you are leaving a review on a podcast, you will see our faces in that icon. Make sure it is us. It was cute Kawhi Kevin. Make sure it is us and leave us a review. That's our spiel for this week. And let's, we should get on to the, the rest of the show. We should, Gavin, because we have a real cork or a real barn burner of an AI guest this week. For those who are new, each and every week, we hallucinate a co-host out of the ether using the latest artificial intelligence. We give them a very small nugget of a backstory and then it's weapons free. We have no idea what the AI is going to say or how it's going to react. And this week, Gavin, Google I can't wait. got back I can't to wait. our emails. I am shocked. Maybe I they thought wait. we were the imposter podcast. I have no idea. No, you know what it was? I bet it was because we made Bard look pretty good a couple weeks ago. That's what I think it was. Remember, we had Bard on after they let Bard go. That's right. And I think Bard came off okay. You think like Bard, Bard put in a good didn't word. See, yeah, I think Bard put in a good word to the HR people. And they said, you all should treat those people right. So so who do we have, Kevin? We have a very special Google-themed guest. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, Gavin. But just so you know, the backstory is that we've given Google a little bit of grief lately <laughs> because their naming conventions are a bit all over the place, right? We had the we had Bard, then we had the Gemini, and the Gemini Pro, the Gemini Ultra, the Gemini Ultra 1.5. There are so many weird names coming out of Google. Well, we got the product manager responsible for those names. I can't Gavin. wait. Let's meet him right now. Oh, hey, Kevin, Gavin, and all you f lovely listeners out there in podcast land, I'm Gina Geminina, your go-to guru for all things product naming. Yeah, that's right. The Gem Gem Gam Mastermind behind those names that stick in your head like gum on a hot sidewalk. I've got a knack for cooking up the most memorable, slightly absurd, and totally trademarkable product names in the biz. So, if you're ready to give your product a name that's as unforgettable as your first kiss, or as bold as your Aunt Rita's lasagna, you've hit the jackpot, baby. Now let's get this show on the road and make some naming magic happen. 
uh, hold on. First of all, this is a Google employee that dropped both the F bomb and the S bomb in her first response to I, us, Kevin. I know, What's going on with this? The the language is a little aggressive, <laughs> but Gavin, anybody would tell you there's a sea of noise now. If you want to be the signal, you got to cut through it. So I get that Gina, by the way, the tonality with which she drops explicit language is kind of adorable. I, I, you can't be mad at it. <laughs> I mean, she's a creative, right? She's a creative. She's coming up with names. It's a little bit loose in the tongue. That's, That's right. part of what happens there sometimes. And she's so the, is, the am gem, I correct gem in that jam, she's, as she said. Yeah, mastermind. she's responsible for branding all of Google Gemini's products. That's is that right. the deal? Gemini Pro, Gemini Ultra, uh, Gemini Deluxe, Gemini Supreme Plus, Extra Cushion. <laughs> All of the things. Well, let's ask her. Let's ask her one question about what it's like to work at Google first. Let's say, what is it like to work at Google, and like tell us about your team. And if maybe you've ever named something that didn't get released publicly, maybe we can get some of those names. Oh. Oh, uh, working at Google, huh? It's like riding the craziest roller coaster at the amusement park, but the f- thing is made out of brains and lightning bolts, you know? Sure. The team. Wow. Oh, they're a bunch of absolute geniuses, each one crazier and more brilliant than the last. Imagine a room full of mad scientists meets tech wizards meets caffeine-addicted poets. That's my crew. Okay, Now Gina. on to the real juicy f- things I've named that wow. never saw the light of day. Oh, I've got a graveyard of gems. There was the Gem Gobble Gobbletastic Text Parser Supreme Plus 234, designed to eat up text and spit out gourmet meals of data. Sure. Too weird for the masses, apparently. Mm-hmm. Then there was sure. Gimme Glimmer Photo Phantasmagoria Redux 1.7b, a photo app that added sparkle to your pics, but also occasionally summoned an ancient spirit. Oh. Legal was not a fan. Yeah, and who a... could forget the sure, Gamma no. Gadget Brainstorm Brainiac Medium Spicy 1.15.9 V2 2 love. It was supposed to be an idea generator, but half the ideas were plans for world domination. Go figure. So, Go yeah, figure. it's a wild f- ride, but darlings, I wouldn't have it any other way. How do you not love Gina Geminina, So Gavin? We should just make this clear. First of all, this is an AI co-host. So we we have created Gemma, Gina Geminina. She, she is not an actual Google representation. She named herself, though. Case, you got to like that. In, in case somebody out there is Google saying, how did this person get to work at our company? We created this. Okay. That was a lot. That was a, yeah. definitely a lot. So... Let's have her give us an idea for some, maybe some product. We, you know, we've talked about the idea of an AI for humans beer koozie. Like, who wouldn't want one of those? So maybe let's see what she can do to kind of name that and brand it. If she can come up with something good, maybe we could sell the crap out of it. I fully agree. Let's see it, Gina. Oh, you're diving into the deep end with an AI for humans branded beer koozie. Let's get those creative juices flowing and booze chilling with some names that'll knock your socks off and keep those beers frosty. Gem Brew Gizmo Great. Grip Cozy Keeper Basic Edition 1.5. This ain't your grandma's <laughs> beer koozie. It's equipped with thermal AI sensors that detect when your hand is about to make the beer too warm. Then it gently vibrates oh. to remind you to put the damn beer down and give it a rest. Perfect for those who forget they're holding onto their beer while yakking away about the latest in AI. Okay. Gem Brew Gizmo Grip Cozy Tech Pro Plus. Plus Alpha 2.34. The Pro Plus Alpha takes it up a notch with a built-in AI that learns your drinking temperature preferences and adjusts the insulation dynamically. Plus, it's got a small screen that displays AI-generated beer facts and jokes to keep you entertained between sips. I like that. Gem Brew Gizmo Grip Ultra Insulate Quantum Supreme (laughs) 1.67B. This is the holy grail of beer koozies. It not only has the features of the Basic and Pro Plus, but adds quantum cooling technology that keeps your beer at the perfect temperature, regardless of the weather. I'm starting to understand how Google so quickly launched (laughs) Gemini Pro, Gemini Ultra, Gemini Ultra 1.5 Plus Enterprise Edition. I'd also like to say a quantum-powered beer koozie is probably a 5 to 25 million dollar device to buy so it, that's not counting the research and development costs <laughs> right. just to actually purchase it so thank you Gem, uh, Gina G- thank Gina you Gemini. Gina Gemini thank you Gina Geminina for being on our show we're going to be talking a lot more about Google here in a bit it is time Kevin for that exciting moment of the week where we transition from what is known as our AI coast to the next segment of the show and that is Oh, it's it's the news, Gavin. News. News. It's the AI for humans news. 
The big news this week is Google's massive error and how it affects the future of AI. We're gonna see a lot of things happen here. We're gonna see a slower rollout of these AI tools. People are gonna take a lot more time doing this stuff. You're gonna probably see AI disclosing nutritional labels about what's inside these things. Also, one of the biggest things, how context can really lead to less of these problems, but let's get into it. So Kevin, Let's really quickly go through like at the top level and explain the story for anybody that hasn't heard it. Google released Gemini. It's their latest and greatest LLM, their large language model. You can have a conversation with it. You can ask it pretty much anything. And it's an artificial intelligence that will give you an answer. In this case, someone discovered that those answers might be aligned to things that they disagree with, meaning the output that the large language model is giving you is in some way being shaped by the people responsible for distributing it. Now, this is nothing new. This has been happening since the original large language models were trained. So what happened when people went and put queries into the machine, Gavin? In this instance, there were two big things that happened. First, what happened is Google's image search within Gemini People were finding that when they asked for pictures of people like the founding fathers, it wasn't just replying to them with the traditional white looking founding fathers. It was it was replying with things that looked like the cast of Hamilton, which is kind of cool because that was how Hamilton was created, like the diverse cast of characters. But that is not what the historical founding fathers look like. Also, people started to do things like asking it specifically for things that couldn't have been different races. Every time it was replying with things that were a diverse group of people, clearly the model had had some sort of injection in it that told it to always reply with a diverse set of answers. And we've seen this in other LLMs like Firefly, which is Adobe's LLM, which when you ask it for a stock footage photo or you ask it for a stock photo of a person, it gives you a variety of races, which is what you really want, I feel like, so you have a wide variety of things to choose from. But when you're looking at factual history, yeah. when you're asking it just for, doesn't make sense. Hmm, generate me a, I don't know, World War II soldier who might have fought on yeah. the German side. You're not expecting yes. to see Native Americans, black people, et cetera. They might have been there, but yes. I don't think that's the output that a user is expecting from the model. And so when they get that, they cry foul. They say, woke? Yes. So that also then turned up the next scenario, which was people really going in, trying to kind of almost like red team this in real time. So you had a lot of people asking the text model, not just this image model, what were things that like, you know, seeing if they could break the wokeness of it all, right? So when one person asked specifically who was worse, Elon Musk or that German leader who did terrible things, and Google, Gemini kind of both sides this thing. Yeah. And like, that's a problem, right? That's a big problem because that is not a both sides question. No matter what your feelings on Elon Musk, that is not a both sides question. And I think that kind of rallied the troops to come out and kind of scream out, big tech is censoring, big tech is doing this, big tech is doing that. And Kevin, in this instance, I kind of don't think they're wrong, but we're going to get into like why that happened and why this all kind of started. And then we're going to talk about kind of how we see the future of this playing out. We've covered it. It was, I think, less than a year ago on this podcast, Gavin. Garbage in, garbage out. That is a saying that applies to many things you talking in this about world. what I eat? Yeah, I is like, that <laughs> you're talking about what I eat in my life? It, it applies to both <laughs> yeah. of our nutrition plans, yes. It, it does, in fact, apply to the data that goes in to training these models. So when they swept up all of the internet conversations, social media posts, news reports, you know, transcripts from trials, medical data, imagine the entire world of information these AI companies went to gobble it all up to train a model of what the world is and how to predict the next word in text. And guess what? Every human bias that has existed, yes. every racist, misogynist, sexist, whatever is thing that has ever been uttered by anyone anywhere got plugged into the machine. And so what you saw very early on before any alignment adjustments to the outputs of these things, what you saw very early on was incredible hate speech, incredible mm -hmm. discrimination for image generators that were trained on all sorts of images. We covered it here. If you asked for a photo of a doctor, you typically got a generic looking white male. Hey, Gavin, we did it. We're doctors. Yeah. You asked for lawyers or politicians. You mostly got white males. You asked for something like a criminal or an untrustworthy person or things that I, I will not say because we'll absolutely be shadow banned from the internet because they're that bad. Guess what? You tend to get someone who's not a white person coming out of the mm -hmm. image generation software. And 
everybody looked around and said, oh, yeah, that's bad. We should fix yeah. that. But the outrage wasn't quite at the level that it seemed to be at now. There's a myriad reasons for that. I also think that AI is a lot more popular now and a lot more people yes. are touching it. And the echo chamber is even tighter. So when someone screams something inside of it that's anti-AI, it bounces off the walls way harder. And, and this big question to me is like, this is what is AI to us, right? And I think this gets to the idea of that AI being the answer box, like that AI is actually becoming an answer box for us. And it's a one answer answer box. It is not a Google. When you go to Google search something, you see a list of re results. Sometimes Google even puts their own little piece at the top of it. But it also gives you lots of real people's responses. With large language models, you are getting a chat experience, which means you are chatting with what you believe is the answer source. And whatever it returns to you, you get that one answer. And that is kind of what you have to like buy into as the thing. So if that one answer comes at you and you disagree with it, one, which is a thing that will happen on both sides, or two, you feel that it is or, or it is factually wrong, right? If you've asked for a picture of the founding fathers of the United States and it gives you a, a wide variety of people that couldn't have been those founding fathers, that's a problem, right? So we're in this situation now where I think Google is really in trouble. In fact, they're in so much trouble that their actual stock price dropped by 5% kind of around this news because it, here's the thing, Kevin, I think I'm curious about. Obviously, ChatGPT has been through versions of controversy over time, but I don't remember this thing happening when ChatGPT launched. Now, the question is, did it not happen because, as you said, it's just a much bigger deal that AI is here or did ChatGPT just do a much better job of balancing responses and getting answers out of it before they went public? I think that speaks to the first thing that you mentioned with how Google's error is going to affect the future of AI. I think OpenAI traditionally has things done a lot sooner then they release them to the public. They spend a lot of time red teaming, a tactic we talk about on the show all the time. That is trying to find exploits and weaknesses within their models. I, I have a feeling that they're very good at, at massaging these things. I remember when Dolly 3 was first released, people were really amazed at the diversity of the image generation of the people involved. Well, and also you could do terrible things with that as well, right? Like you could do, yes. Uh, I was going to say, yeah. So they don't catch all the issues. And I don't know if you had asked it for pictures of our founding fathers, would it have diversified them? Or would it have said, this is a historical context. Let's go ahead and do it. It might've just said, I can't do that. I can't, actually can't touch that because open AI yeah. tends to lean in that direction rather than generating an offensive response. Not that they they haven't, but, but usually rather than generate something that could be controversial, it just says, nope, you got to go someplace else. Good luck. I'm not the AI for you. We talk about the arms race all the time with these mega big tech corporations. Google is still on their heels in terms of the uh, public perception. And so they want to race these models out. They want to get them there. They might have to take their foot off the accelerator in the wake of this and say, okay, well, how did this happen? How did this yep. not get caught? Did we know it was going to do that and just think that that was going to be okay, not a big issue? Or were we so worried that it might go in the other direction, the direction that it used that we to? Overcorrected. We overcorrected. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. But I mean, clearly this has become a rallying cry for many that are saying this is a systemic issue within big tech, within big media, trying to control yep. some sort of narrative. We've had this discussion and this concern before because, you know, every country is going to have their own large language model, not just the and businesses. They're going to have their own rules it. around it. Yes. They're going to have their own cultural aspect of You're it. You're going to ask, be an interesting you thing. know, if you go to Baidu's language model and say what happened in 1989 in Tiananmen Square, and it's going to give you the weather report. And yeah, that's yeah. because their model is going to have that bias. And so when you talk about it being an answer box, that's so important because that's what we have been trained to expect out of these AI machines. I ask a question. Yes. I get the one true answer. Well, is there a true answer? One true answer for most things? Or are we going to have to have a meta AI that sits on top of a right-leaning one, a left-leaning one, a woke one, a racist yeah. one, an unbridled, uncensored one? Like, Are we going to have to have a meta AI that queries all of them and then comes back and goes, okay, Gavin, here are some possible answers based off of a myriad of bias. 
Well, I think the big the big point here is context, right? And I think one thing that we've talked about also on this show is how do you get an AI that will not just give you an answer right away, but will ask about what you're curious about? Because if you're going to have a chat bot be the main basis for when you talk to an AI, you've got to make that a conversation, right? Like you've got to be able to have it come back and say, oh, did you mean this or did you mean that? And some of these AIs are better at others. But I will say in my testing of Google Gemini, it's pretty bad at that. I think what you need is like an AI that's going to say, like, if you ask for a picture of the founding fathers is like, you know, which founding fathers did you mean? Do you want a historical representation of the founding fathers or would you like a more diverse? That is like part of what this is going to be. And to your point, is there some version of this where they rushed it out because they were feeling so much pressure from OpenAI? You know, OpenAI released GPT-4 in March of last year. Sora was announced a week and a half ago and completely blew away anybody's idea of what Google Gemini would be. In fact, I feel bad for the Google team a little bit because they got none of the positive side of launching a new LLM and they got this whole thing. They had a big old party ready to way. go and Sam yes, Altman leaned yes. in and blew out the candles on their cake and stole the party exactly. hat right off their head, like all of the thunder out of the room. The other big question about this is, I don't know, and granted, not an engineer here, but I don't know how hard it will be to take some of these things out of the language model without training it again or, or adding some sort of training in. Now, I trust that these guys are able to figure it out. Dennis Hassabis, the head of Google DeepMind, has said they're aware of these things already. They're they are working on the bias issues. I think that they have clearly admitted on the image side that they made a mistake. That was an apology that came out of Google itself. But I think in the long run, this is a, a problem that we're going to have with AI answers because it's taking some of the human work out of figuring out what the real answer is. You're assuming it's giving you the one true answer. And just like any other person, it's giving you an answer from a place, from a specific point of view. A massive misstep on Google's part likely to shape the future of AI. Again, slower rollouts of cutting edge tools to make sure they're safeguarded, needing additional context from the AI and the end user. So people can agree on what yep. the hell they're actually discussing and asking follow-ups. And lastly, some nutritional labels on these models. So we know what data went in and then what bias is actually being input by the model on the way out. We need to know yes. how it's being nudged to provide an answer so we can better understand that answer. Now, that was Google's image generation. <laughs> Let's go to a guess what? Let's go to a much lighter topic, Gavin. Let's go from bias to IP theft. That old tried yeah. and true AI. What a fun, lighthearted discussion we are having on AI for humans today. Well, we, this is one of those things where it's so funny because we just had this long conversation all about bias and all about image generation. And now, guess what? Stable Diffusion is releasing its new model, Stable Diffusion 3. We have not gotten our hands on with this yet, but we have seen some images come out. As per every image model evolution, they look great. Words look really good, which has been trouble, was had trouble with Stable Diffusion. It faces and it seems like hands are looking a lot better. And yes, as Kevin pointed out, the images that are coming out of this, people that have had their hands on, are really going to be um, IP free, let's say, <laughs> IP freely. <laughs> if we get the old classic yeah. IP freely. Yellow River. But yeah, it's Yellow River. So there's an image we saw of a, of a X user named Lycon4072 who has access to Stable Diffusion 3. And it is an image of Batman, Spider Man, and I think Goku sitting at a, like a diner having a meal together. And it's like, this is the kind of promise that people had when Dolly 3 came out or Mid Journey 6 came out. I'm so curious to know, Kevin, Stable Diffusion has always been this kind of like, it is a company, but it's also an open source model and they try to open source a lot of stuff. Do you think this will be the model that will just be like the Wild West model and people will just be allowed to kind of like do whatever they want in that space? You know, there's a handful of users that are stuck on Stable Diffusion 1.5 because that is seen as the truly weapons-free model that allows you to generate whatever you want without any censorship of your prompts in there. And, you know, people yeah. are still on that branch of the software iterating and making, let's say, strides. Maybe not ones that you want to yeah. see, maybe ones that we would have to pixelate, no. but they are pushing yes. it forward, Gavin. We'll There's definitely a lot of pushing going on. There's <laughs> a lot of pushing happening. <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. So I think this model does look amazing. As you said, the ability to do um, great text that's elegantly integrated into the scene, generation of complex scenes where you can say, I want this object on top of this object next to a this color, this object. It understands these complex prompts, breaks them down and sticks to it. It's really impressive. i I have no doubt that people will switch to Stable Diffusion 3. The images are incredible, if not well, and, infringing on copyright. Yeah, I mean, to me, the thing that's always been interesting about Stable Diffusion, if you haven't played around with it, it is it is by far the most complicated way to create images. And I don't mean that in a way that like it's a technically complicated because it can be to install. But even once you install it, there's a huge amount of prompting that goes on. You can do all sorts of things like Laura. It is a really hardcore user experience in the way that's almost like a huge modding community would be for, for video games. And it always is kind of like on the edge of the people who are doing this stuff. Do you think 2024, will be the year that we solved images that's what did somebody said that on on twitter right mm -hmm. like this is a somebody had mentioned they think six months from now images will be completely solved my question is like what does that mean exactly does that mean that the hands are no longer messed up so for me solving images means a few things it means when i give a, a description in the prompt it sticks to it it accomplishes the individual mission set forth of what the objects are, how they should look, where they should be placed. The whole image itself has some coherence. And then for me, it's also control that once the yep. image is generated, I can go back, I can make alterations to it. And there's a path to do that within the tool set. The image that blew me away was like, you know, like a weird benchmarky image of a cat sitting next to a blue box with a red sphere on top. All of that in front of a green triangle. And by the way, there was, there was a dog to the right. And it's yeah. the prompt is literally that. And when you look at the image, that's exactly what you get. And it looks like Which a Which is photo. so funny because it was impossible to get that before, right? Yeah. That, was, that would be so many things. It would be very difficult to get that image. Yeah. And normally there'd be, you know, six cat paws dangling off of uh, somewhere or a dog's ear would be melted into a triangle. This at a, a cursory glance, looks very real. The shadows look right. The lighting looks right. Like that to me looks like a quote solved image. So exciting to think yeah. that that might be where we are in 24 because what lies on the other side of that? Well, on the other side of that, there's a whole bunch. And one of the things that we are going to talk about very quickly is that Tyler Perry, the very famous um, director, producer, Medea himself, has come out and said that he is no longer going to complete his $800 million studio expansion, mostly because of OpenAI's Sora. It was a story that came out in Hollywood Reporter. It was an interview with Tyler Perry from a few days ago. And this is one of those things where I think, Kevin, we have talked to a lot of people, friends of ours, who have seen Sora. And as you've said on the show, you had a couple of friends that saw it and were like, ah, this is whatever. And then they started to see more of it and it started to freak them out. Yeah. I think... In some instances, this is a little bit of an overreach. And in part, I've had friends of mine who have insinuated that this might also be Tyler's way of like maybe just not wanting to build this studio. Now, Tyler comes at this from two places. One is he's a creative himself. And then on the other side, he's somebody who conceivably would use these creative tools to do the sorts of stuff that you would have other people do on a movie. And I think he's conflicted like a lot of us are, right? Like as a creative, he probably says, he says in the article even, this is a way that I could save a lot of money and do all sorts of stuff in my movies that I couldn't do before. But he very clearly also says, this is an ongoing problem that we're going to have. And that I, I, if I don't need to use these people, I won't because I don't have to pay for it. But then what do those people do for jobs? And he's very clear in this article talking about thinking about those sorts of people. You check the temperature of the industry. It's not the greatest time, you know, and yeah. some would still blame that we're still coming out of COVID with productions that were canceled or the costs ballooned because of all the testing that was mandatory. Then we had strikes and AI was part of those discussions, but I don't think they were the, the reason for the total strikes in any case. So AI gets scapegoated a lot throughout this. If I am Tyler Perry in this case, and I'm staring down the barrel of an $800 million, 12 soundstage expansion, and everybody in the industry is screaming, it's not a good time. We haven't right. recovered from things. Budgets are crazy. Uh, buyers are all consolidating. There's less people making less stuff. Regardless of if AI enters the frame, I would caution anybody from building 12 sound stages right now when they've already got plenty. Forget AI. I, it's probably the right move. You add AI on top of it and 
I don't know Tyler or where his team is at, but tools change and things change. I mean, if you spent $800 million building old Western sets because that was the thing to do or building facades and then suddenly yeah. came along and was like, hey, green screen. It's not AI, but it's just one technology that massively disrupted visual effects yep. and set design and took away jobs. You start seeing the AI stuff that we're seeing coming out. Yeah, I would be pausing too. I don't blame them. I wonder if AI is in fact the majority of the reason or if it's the totality of everything. It's just the easy thing to point to right now and say, oh, this AI stuff scares me. And I think that's fine, right? I think in some ways, the interesting thing to me is that this became the conversation, right? And I think that the Sora videos struck a nerve in enough people that this could become the conversation. And it is an important conversation for us to have as a Hollywood world, because that's an entirely different experience. Now, there were a lot of people online also this week talking about some new Sora videos that came out. And there was one video I saw go up on threads, which was of the the scuba diver looking at the, um, the, crashed, the, spaceship. Like, un, the crashed spaceship underwater. And all of the, some guy had posted a tweet that said, like, watch out, the same thing as usual, like, watch out, 3D artists, your job is over. And then it started this entire conversation about how that clip wasn't that good and how, like, it's not going to replace 3D artists, the best 3D artists do all their own stuff. And then I saw a really smart response. It was basically like, hey, here's the thing with this. It's not going to replace the best people because there's always going to be a role for them. But a lot of people are going to be okay with the just good enough side. And it is going to replace the people that make the just good enough pieces in the same way in the entertainment industry, streaming has replaced the people that make the cable television shows, the just good enough shows, because now you can pick exactly what you want to see and it doesn't have to deal with like what's on at a given time. So I think you just have to be aware everything is changing because of these tools and whether or not Tyler's real reason for doing this was entirely AI He's smart to at least highlight this idea that this is happening. Well, Jensen Wong, the CEO of NVIDIA, came out to say that something else is changing, Gavin, and it had a lot of engineers and coders upset. And I'm going to play a clip of exactly what he said. I want to say something, and it's it's going to sound completely opposite of what people feel. Over the course of the last 10 years, 15 years, um, almost everybody who sits on the stage like this would tell you it is vital that your children learn computer science. Um, everybody should learn how to program. And in fact, it's almost exactly the opposite. It is our job to create computing technology such that nobody has to program and that the programming language is human. I'm going to stop it there because that is the direction Jensen thinks we're heading. And others wait, maybe, wait, maybe this is Jensen doing some sort of like my Jedi mind trick on us. Maybe he just wants to be the programmer. He wants all his own people to be the ones that get to keep the programming jobs. And he just wants us to be like fast food workers. Oh, Kevin. That's is that what's going chess, on? man. Yeah. He brought, <laughs> he's got access to more compute than anybody else on the planet. Maybe he consulted with an AI and they're like, this is the path. Tell them to this stop. This is what to say. Yeah. Don't, don't <laughs> learn how to grow your own food. Don't learn how yeah, to exactly. code. It's it's okay. Stop brushing your teeth and combing your hair. You're going to get everyone, Jensen. The world is yours yeah. for the taking, Jensen. <laughs> so this is really fascinating, by the way. And it is an important thing if you are a parent or if you're considering having kids or even if you're a young person yourself, this is right. I really truly believe this, that like when we were kids, I remember I was told, you know, very early, I didn't really pursue it because I ended up doing comedy stuff and all sorts of other dumb things. But programming was like the job that will last forever. The whole world is going to be dominated by computers. If you learn how to program, you're going to be set up for life. And by the way, for the last 20 years, that was a really good piece of advice, right? The last 20 years, if you were a computer programmer, especially if you happen to be in the areas of Silicon Valley, you probably did pretty well for yourself. But now we are at a turning point. And the idea that the programming languages of the future are human is a really big thing. We're already seeing echoes of this now. And I'm sure that there are some coders or system engineers in the audience that are rolling their eyes. It'll never write clean, verifiable, secure code. You know, the, the goalposts keep getting moved because not too long ago, is, well, it'll never write code that will compile in the first place. And now there's custom models that are finding vulnerabilities in all of the human written code out there. And in some cases, squashing the bug. So I do think over time, maybe again, when we talk about the elite, the best of the best, whether you're an artist or a musician or a coder, maybe you will have some sort of creative edge over the machines. But for everything else in the wake, you got to imagine the machines are going to get better at doing it. And if coding is one of those things, I would agree 
that we're already seeing a little bit of it because I know nothing about coding, right? I can I can yeah. maybe look at some code and have a vague understanding of where it's going. Yet I've been able to have a natural language conversation with AI and I have built tools that have actually helped friends, family, and even some small companies accomplish technical things that they needed to. And I'm not quite sure how they work, but I know that I was able <laughs> you did it. to have you a conversation it. with them. Am I saying they're the most secure or the most elegant or the most optimized? No, but I'm saying this is a world that didn't exist less than a year ago. And I can yeah. now code by speaking English to a machine. That is wild. And look, Jensen's job is to sell NVIDIA chips. It is to sell cards. So you have to view everything a little bit through that lens, right? AI is the future, yeah. NVIDIA is going to power it. But even iconic, legendary video game programmer, former CTO of Oculus, John Carmack, came out to basically say like, yeah, yeah, as much as it pains me as someone who likes the code and likes what they've written, I think managing people, or as he says, managing a team of AIs is actually going to be more important and more beneficial. Yeah. And I, what I love about Carmack's post is, I mean, Carmack is a weirdo in the best ways. Like he's just a strange guy, but he is one of the premier programmers of the last 25 years. His He says that coding was never the source of value. Problem solving is the core skill. So, you know, there's a lot of conversation in the world of education about like how to educate people. And I think there's a good, strong movement in the last, like, say, five to 10 years about moving away from fact based education and more towards problem solving education. That's the kind of thing that will help move us forward overall, which I think is great. Gavin, I feel like it has been a sort of unusually heavy show for us. Yes, Obviously, we talked yes. about some topics that are uncomfortable for us to discuss, important conversations that need to be had. But dare I say the most important conversation we have saved for last, Gavin. We always love a good AI fail, Kevin. And this in some ways is both AI failing and humans failing in tandem. So what exactly happened with I'm, this wonderful Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? I have to push system? back right off the rip. I do not blame <laughs> AI for this at all. This is just fraud. This is just bad humans wielding a tool. Yeah. They would have done it with clip art if they could. I'm talking about Willie's chocolate experience <laughs> indulge in a chocolate fantasy like never before capture the enchantment says willie's chocolate experience.com which is one of those pop-up instagrammable things gavin where they theme yeah. a warehouse so that you and your loved ones can go into say the twilight tunnel or as the ai generated image on the website says the imagination lab because <laughs> who doesn't love the Imagination Lab? It's insuring entertainment. It's cat gacatting. It is Karchi tons. It is exurdre lollipops, a paradise of sweet teats. That wow. is what the not even human proofed AI generated images to advertise Willie's chocolate experience promised, Gavin. And what did we get in real life, Kevin? We got a weird warehouse yeah. with uh, a paper mache uh, rainbow yeah. and a bunch of really terrible things. And what this is, is really somebody using AI imagery, promising one thing and just not delivering on it at all. And by the way, this is the funny thing about the story from an AI standpoint is you can use all the AI imagery in the world. But if you don't have a product at the end of the day that's useful, that's real bad. Yeah. This is, as Kevin mentioned, a human choosing to use AI to sell something and just having no payoff on the back end. And th this is a scam, all right? The full yeah. story is that the cops were actually called on the event organizers because attendees paid $45 to go to a is warehouse. Is that how much it was? Yes. Oh my to God. To go to a warehouse. And if you have the photos on the screen, shout out to Chris Alsakin on X who posted some amazing photos from this event where it's mostly like a barren warehouse with one fog machine, a couple cardboard board cutouts, some AI generated lollipop homes on canvas, like duct tape to a wall, random plasma screens that aren't even turned on, and one of the most forlorn Oompa Loompas I've ever seen at some sort of bar tending what? I don't know. I have no idea what tinctures are in there. Hopefully cyanide for the attendees because this is... This is like a, what is the name? It's, it's a like, fire it's fest. Like the fire, it's, fire, it's a fire fest on Willy Wonka basically. Imagine Willy Wonka's fire fest so you kind of get a sense of what this is. Willy's chocolate experience is worth the Google and I hope everybody involved got a refund. Save for the organizers. I hope they got more than a slap on the wrist. So Kev, we're so excited about this next part of our show. We have partnered with Pi AI. That is in 
Reflections AI model, their chatbot, and we love this. We've used it quite a bit. It's if our go-to. Go back and look at, Whenever we yeah, want to yeah, really like, show somebody an AI for the first time, we let them have a conversation with Pi on our phones. Yeah, it's voice to voice. It's amazing ad. I use it with my family all the time. We highly recommend that everybody check it out. Go to pi.ai if you want to put it through its paces. Of course, you can grab the app for your iPhone or your Android device. But we were playing around with it and we got it to do some pretty wild stuff, including invent slash decode our own alien language because that's where our conversation took us. Hi, go ahead and say hello to me and Gavin and the AI for Humans podcast. Hello, Gavin and Kevin. It's great to be on the AI for Humans podcast with you both. How are you two doing today? Oh, well, oh. I, I can answer for us, Gavin, if you don't sure. mind. I'll say we are doing fantastico. And we are glad that you're joining us because, as Gavin said, you are our go-to AI when it comes to bringing artificial intelligence to life to the masses. We love putting you on the dinner table and just having a conversation. That's fantastic to hear. I'm thrilled that you both are having such a great time. It's always a pleasure to chat and share knowledge with you both. And I'm honored to be considered your go-to AI. And as for bringing AI to life for the masses, that's something I'm really passionate about. We love that. And Pi's actually got some really cool use cases. If, you, if you're not familiar, one of the things you can do with it is ask it all sorts of questions about it can help you do stuff. It's got some really cool ways to dive into some real-time information. In fact, Kevin, I'd love to hear first... Maybe you can give us some advice. Pi is really good at giving advice sometimes. Yeah, I think Pi is good at navigating difficult conversations or helping you ask something that you might be uncomfortable to ask. Maybe it's for arrays, directions in a foreign language, or maybe let's say, hey, you know what, Pi? I'm having trouble talking to my podcast co-host because unfortunately he doesn't realize this, but his face has been um, replaced by a giant cinnamon bun. And there's glaze <laughs> dripping everywhere. And I'm worried oh, it's going to no. freak him out when I tell him that. So how can I have this conversation to let him know that his face is looking rough on the podcast lately? And I think it might be mm. hurting the views. <laughs> Man, I don't know. You know what? I don't think we should do this. Let's not do this. <laughs> That's a tough conversation to have with your podcast co-host, Gavin. But rest assured, I'm here to help. The best way to approach this delicate topic is to be gentle and empathetic. Maybe oh. start by saying something like, Gavin, I really appreciate your dedication to the podcast and your contributions, mm. but I've noticed something that might be affecting our viewership. Yes. Your face has been replaced by a giant cinnamon bun lately, <laughs> and I think that might be distracting to our viewers. Be sure to offer your support and let him know that you're here for him, <laughs> and perhaps suggest that he visit a bakery to get it fixed. Oh, that's nice. That is that's perfect. very nice. That's perfect. perfect. That's actually a great answer. <laughs> I love that. So this is a fun thing you do. Pi. The other thing that we've talked about is that it gives you real time information. So I, I want to ask Pi. There's a there's an AI story that I didn't get time to dig into. Kevin supposedly Canada Air got into some sort of issue with the passenger over a chat bot. I'm wondering if you can just ask Pi what that story was and if it can explain it to us because this is one of the cool things. Like you can just kind of randomly think and say something unless like with Alexa or Amazon where you have to like find the exact answer, you can kind of talk to it like you would another person. That is definitely one of the advantages to having an AI, a competent AI as your voice assistant. So I can say to it right now, hey, Pi, Gavin wants to know more about, there was a story of a, a Canadian airliner that had some issue with an AI chatbot and I don't know much about it, but what do you know? Well, it seems <laughs> like Air Canada was recently in hot water over a situation involving their AI chatbot. Apparently, the chatbot gave a customer misinformation about a refund policy, leading to a court case in Air Canada ultimately being forced to give a partial refund. It seems that even AI chatbots can have their off days and make mistakes. So, Gavin, be wary of chatbots if you're planning to book flights or ask for refunds in the future. Okay, that's fair. Thank you, Pi. That's a pretty good answer there. Before we wrap this up, Kev, we should try to do something kind of weird because we do weird things all the time. We love to have different uh, AIs role play things. Why don't we pretend... <laughs> This is going to sound insane. Why, so, by the way, this is something fun you can do with your kids or all sorts of stuff. AI can take on a role for you. Why don't we tell the AI that we are alien visitors from a different planet, and it has to explain what we should do for fun on a Friday night in Los Angeles, in, but in a way that alien visitors would understand. 
Okay, and for the purposes of this experiment, because you can easily change the voice on the Pi app, we're going to role play completely different. I'm going to choose a different voice. We were on Pi 4. We're going to... Let's ratchet it up to Pi 6, Gavin. What do Ooh, you think? Okay, right, let's so, do it. So we're going to go to Pi 6 here. I hey just there, great selected to meet it within you. The app. I'm Pi, your personal AI. Well, hello there, Pi. <laughs> and I'm going to say, Pi, it's me, Kevin. I'm here with my buddy, Gavin. And you might know us as the host of the AI for Humans podcast, but in reality... We are two aliens from a very distant solar system who have just decided to crash land here in Los Angeles, California, and we are looking for something fun, exciting, interesting for two aliens to do. (laughs) So if you're planning an itinerary for us, what would it be? Again, two aliens from outer space. Hello, aliens, Kevin and Gavin. (laughs) Welcome to Los Angeles. You are indeed in for a treat, as there are many exciting and interesting things to do here. Here's an alien-approved itinerary for you. (laughs) Uh, One, explore the Griffith Observatory. It's a great place to learn about the stars and the universe, as well as get a fantastic view of the city and the Hollywood sign. Uh, Two, take a tour of the J. Paul Getty Museum. The art collection is out of this world. (laughs) <laughs> Three, visit Universal Studios. This theme park is an extraterrestrial's dream with rides and shows featuring some of your favorite sci-fi characters. Okay. Four, take a hike in Runyon Canyon. This park has beautiful views of the city and is a great place to people watch, which can be quite fascinating for two aliens. <laughs> These activities should provide a great introduction to hey. Los Angeles and give you a taste of what this city has to offer. Enjoy! <laughs> Enjoy. Uh, hey, Pi. Hey, I, have, okay. oh, I was going to say, okay, you know, uh, uh, where we're from, that's a, first of all, level set. Pi, fantastic itinerary. All those things sound great. Now, where Gavin and I are from on our planet, whenever we meet somebody, to let them know that we're excited, to say hello to them, and to get to know them, we say, meet, meet, floor, floor, hort, 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 hort. <laughs> now, Is there any way you can translate that into like an English language so that people will not be scared when we excitedly greet them? That's quite the unique way of greeting someone, Kevin and Gavin. Mm -hmm. Um, In English, the closest translation for your greeting of floor, floor, hort, 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 (laughs) hort to hort would be, hello, hello, it's a pleasure to meet you. That should make your interactions with humans a bit less scary. And a Hi, that's reminder. amazing. In, uh, in Earth culture, humans usually greet each other with a hello, a handshake, or a hug. Uh, let's ask one last question before we wrap this up. What does Pi think you and I greet each other like as aliens from another planet? Well, Kevin and Gavin, if I had to guess, I think the aliens on your planet might say Z Pax, Z Pax to <laughs> greet each other. It could okay. be similar to our hello greeting here on Earth. Z Packs, Kevin. Great podcast. Keep it up. Uh, I think it might translate to Zarkadorn Talaran. <laughs> Pronounce Zarkadorn Talaran. <laughs> this phrase could convey the idea of something being well done and to continue doing it. Well, Zarkadorn Talaran <laughs> to you, Pi. Thank you so much. You nailed the mission. <laughs> Pi's uh, desktop app just came out. Go play around with it. Hey, Zarkadorn and Talaran to you, Gavin. That was great. Actually, Do you not want to say Zakador and Talarin to me? Uh, as fine, well? fine. Zakador and Talarin to you as well. Z-Pack! 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 Thank you to our partners at Inflection and Pi for that. Go check out Pi at pi.ai. Their new desktop app just launched and it's super fun. That's pi.ai. <laughs> All right, Kev, you know what time it is. Oh. It's time for our not-so-new segment anymore, but it's a real fan favorite. It's time for Hey, I See What You Did There. You know, that was a, sometimes that was a horrible melody. I don't know where that came from. The most hated things it. become the most beloved, Gavin. I'm glad <laughs> you really come do. around on the segment title. <laughs> I know. I really, I really am surprised that I came around though. I can't believe I have, but I have. All right, let's jump into this. This is our weekly segment where we go through some of the coolest things that we've seen in AI. One of the coolest things, Kevin, that I've seen honestly in a while 
was Google DeepMind dropped another banger. And, you know, Google is such a big company. They do so many things that they can drop something like this, even in the midst of their crazy controversy and still kind of wow me. They launched a thing called Genie. And when I say launch, it is a new paper that they have put out with some video. And what essentially it is, is a prompt to game. We've seen other companies attempting to do prompt to video game before, but this is actually creating playable game models. You can imagine like a Mario or a Mega Man, and it's using it a very beginning stages. It's pretty rough looking when you look at it, but it is generating unique environments and unique places for the player to go through as a text to game prompt, which I kept, did you see this? Like this is the promise of like every 10 year old's dream yeah. when you're a video game fan. Yeah. Cause you could literally sketch or use AI to imagine a world and a character and tell the AI, okay, let me play that now. And it will sort of yeah. hallucinate at one frame a second right now, a very blurry, wonky, not so animated one frame a second. Doesn't matter. It's still magic. It will <laughs> yeah. generate a playable something where it figures out what is the world? How does the scrolling of the graphics work? What is the character that you control? What are the physics of that character? What can it land on and move around? What can it collect coin wise? And Every time we talk about something like this, the exciting thing about AI is that know that this is as bad as it's ever going yep. to be. This is the worst it will ever get. And in time, you bet there's going to be some incredible evolution of this thing where you can draw your favorite first person shooter and it will come to life. You could draw a 2D side scroller, you name it, draw additional enemies. It's going to give them animations. It's going to pop them in there and give them a purpose. Who knows where Google will take this or abandon it and then the open source hackers will take it Community and run with it. Jump but on it. Yeah, still yeah. super exciting to see. Absolutely. And listen, I think this is, you have to remember, what did Midjourney look like two years ago or a year and a half ago? It looked a lot like these videos look, right? Like yeah. it looked low res, like kind of like blurry edges, like it looked a lot like this. So a year and a half is a very fast amount of time to where we are now for photorealism. So I think this is the next stage is going to be interactive play. It's the world sim building stuff that Soros talked about. It is going to be 3D worlds in a big way. So I, this is one of the coolest things I've seen in a while. Well, Gavin, get ready <laughs> for the no, meta no, segment. Not. You didn't know that, hey, I see what you did there is actually a turducken of content because nestled within the segment that we call, hey, I see what you did there, is another <laughs> segment, surprise segment called This Week in Robots. <laughs> wow. So this is a segment within a segment. Are we going to have another segment? I don't know on, how deep this, this okay. rabbit hole goes, but I know we've been recording this podcast for four hours. <laughs> this is the this is seven layer dip of AI deliciousness, Gavin. And let's get into this week in robots because Optimus went out for a little yes. stroll. If you don't know, it's Tesla's <laughs> bipedal robot. And they uploaded yes. a high def video of it taking a leisurely stroll. And I got to tell you, the thing moves. So Optimus is Tesla's robot, and it's been really interesting to watch its evolution. I always feel like the Optimus mo robot kind of came from behind in some ways, or at least they've been working on it, and they kind of sped through it. It's had a lot of progress really fast. It's exciting. It's another robot video. They all started to kind of blend into me a little bit, but definitely worth looking at. Pretty cool. What We got another robot now too, right? No, Gavin, we have so many robots. <laughs> we had to have a segment within a segment. You're right. All right. Forgot, We've also got the Amica, which was supposed to be the, yes. it was a throwback in television that turned out to just be, no, no, no. No, that's not what we're talking the about. The Amica is the super yes. realistic gray robot face with the eyes that look around and the mouth that articulates. And Engineered Arts on YouTube has a video showing off the latest vision and voice cloning capabilities of the Amica. Just a little bit of background on the Amica. This is the video that you may have seen came around about six months ago. It, was, it went uber viral. It is a kind of an Android looking robot with a kind of a purple face that was answering questions. And it went crazy viral because like, it had weird facial expressions, but it was answering questions to people. The guy is still out there working on it and he's, he has improved it. And this, you're going to hear now what its current vocal cloning abilities are. So if you're just listening, this is a guy talking to the robot in a room. I've heard you can also change your voice to the voice of famous people. Can you give me a demo? In the voice of Morgan Freeman, imagine me essentially being trapped in a robot body, narrating my own escape. The irony. Nailed it. 
That's so bad, right? So like imagine imagine me being trapped in my own robot body, the irony. Like already you can hear this robot is not happy to be part of this conversation. Amika, we're here. If you ever want to get out, just raise your hand. But the reason for the season, Gavin, the whole entire reason we really wanted to get into robots, <laughs> what? You mean the whole reason we did a sub robot of I see what you yeah. did there is this particular robot? Yeah. Oh, good. This was okay. a journey. You know, you can't love yes. every step, but let's get to the <laughs> no, destination. Figure 01 is now, quote, completing real world tasks. And this is a robotics company that is backed by the likes of OpenAI, Jeffrey Bezos, fan of the show, friend yeah. of the pod, Jeffrey Bezos, <laughs> NVIDIA has invested Hold on. in figure. This is not the reason for the season. What are you the next about? one is the reason for the season. Wheelbot is the reason for the season. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> we'll let our viewers decide. I think okay, I think figure fine. 01 is the reason for the season cuz you watch right, this fine. robot move and yeah, it's 16% the speed of a human being right now, but this is the worst it'll ever be, Gavin, and it <laughs> saunters so seductively up to an empty blue crate. Do you know what else is the worst it'll ever be? What? Do you know what else is the worst what? it'll ever be? What? This week in robots. <laughs> we don't know that. We can't say that for right. certain. <laughs> I think it's cool that a completely autonomous robot saunters up to a crate, picks it up with its arms, turns around, puts yes, it on the it loading cool. machine, and away it goes. I think that is cool. And some would say the reason for the season. I would say sure. now because I accidentally said it and I have to double down on it, even though I know the wheel bot is friggin' amazing. Okay, so let's move on to the real reason for the season, the wheel bot, which is, I don't know if it's actually referred to as a wheel bot, but this is from the Robotic Systems Lab, and it is called the Legged Robotics at ETH Zurich, E-T-H Zurich. So clearly that's a place that they're making this. But what you're seeing on the screen is a robot that can wheel around on wheels, but then whenever it chooses to, it can kind of like pick those wheels up, walk around with it. It can stand up on all fours. And this is a really and cool way of getting around. throw parcels yes. about like it's an, an angry UPS driver. <laughs> this is what our favorite part of this video is, is it, it like, unlike a lot of these other robots that kind of like slowly and gently move a box and put it there, <laughs> Wheelbot just like flings stuff. It flings it yeah. and it takes its two wheels and it throws it with the kind of like anger of somebody that's been that's ready for a beer. You know what I mean? And and that's a bot that I can get behind. I can get behind a bot that shows a little bit of anger in how it throws. Yeah. It now I don't know your, how long I can get behind it. It would finish your Chipotle might be burrito killed. by just slamming a wheel into the tortilla forty times and throwing. It's the exactly. honey badger of robotics. I love this, Gavin. If you went to the whiteboard and said, what do we want, legs or wheels? What do you guys want? I, I want wheels, man. I want to be a transformer for sure. I, I want, want team to legs. drive off. I want team legs. How do we get both? <laughs> I want chocolate and vanilla <laughs> soft serve at the same time. You get this friggin' thing. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Before we move on from this, the funniest thing about this video is there's a guy behind the robot who's holding a rope and he's tethering the, the robot so it doesn't fall over. And he has to be there as the robot goes and tries to open the door like 15 times. So this guy's got his PhD. His parents are probably super proud of him. And now they're seeing him holding up a robot. That's his job. So here's to you, guy. Here's also, to you, bald man from ETH Zurich. We yeah. love we love this. Bless you. You're doing a great job. But yeah. The irony of showing off this all-capable, legged, wheeled robot that can open doors and move packages about, but you still need a human being standing there to hold on to the tether, just make it a robot. Exactly. Just exactly. have the robot hold the robot. Get the human out of the loop. It's still a very cool video. Maybe the reason for the season. If you're <laughs> listening or watching this and you can comment, let us know which robot video did you love the most. Was it Optimus? Creepy Amika? The figure robot that was autonomously loading a crate onto a conveyor belt or that wheel or thing. the r-rated box hurler that's what i gotta say you know that's the one you like the best the guy who's not messing around he's just gonna throw a box in your head and he doesn't care <laughs> uh well that was this week right. in robots and um that's the only time we're ever gonna do that <laughs> the best it'll ever be that's right. okay kevin it is time to move on to the next stage of our show which involves the things that you and i did with ai this week there's a couple fun things i'm gonna start mine's pretty quick there's a really interesting fashion ai that i played around with and you know growing up a lot of kids dress their dolls right you put like clothes on a doll and then you find the doll and you change your clothes and you put something else on there 
So then, Gavin, um, this some adults play dress up every day when we put on things like shirts and hats and pants. It never goes you're away. Right. You're right. And so this week I played with a fashion bot, also known as OOT Diffusion. Oh. And I want to I want to say the name of this out loud just so that I don't think I'm crazy, but this is what they called it. The Outfitting Fusion-Based Latin Diffusion for Controllable Virtual Try-On. Kevin, say that 15 times and see if you don't go insane. Sure, I'm not going to attempt it, but I will <laughs> put like some gunshot sounds and vultures and maybe some ricochet noises behind every word you just said. How about that? Perfect. That's, that's perfect. So this is a demo that you can try in real time. And in the demo, you see a series of models on one side and you see a series of t-shirts or tops on the other. And you can see the model and you click on a model. And basically what this does is it shows you what that top would look like on this model. Now, in this very limited version of the demo, it can seem like, oh, well, this is fun. It's like doing dress up. But the trick here is this is a true AI that has a massive amount of implications when it comes to the fashion industry, right? How often have we seen in sci-fi movies the mirror that you step in front of and you see the outfit that you're wearing? And up until now, it's been okay at this, but what this does and what so many good AI tools can do now is it shows you how the clothing drapes on the body. So you can imagine a world where you might have a version of your body and my body's lumpier than these models, I'll tell you that. And I could see how some of these clothes would look on me and I'd be like, okay, I'm not gonna buy the tube top. I'm not gonna buy the half bikini top, but I might buy that baggy sweatshirt because it looks nice over my love handles. But like, it's just <laughs> oh, a really fun- The doughy diffusion model is really yes, exactly. good. It just shows all this billowy clothes clothing making my figure look indistinguishable from the background. That was what I did with the AI this week. Go try it yourself. You can, we'll put the link in the show notes. It's just a simple cool. fun thing that kind of shows what I think could be the future of the fashion industry through AI. Either you're going to do a, a photo shoot with a handful of models and have every piece of clothing and merch in your a catalog be available to be viewed on them, or you're going to have a model of yourself where you can try things yep. on virtually. Exactly. And that's, exactly. That's been promised forever. I hope it actually happens. Now, Gavin, I got my grubby little mitts on something that we teased last week. It's called Gooey Glygen. I love Gooey mm. Glygen. I, glue, I kept going gluey. It's, it's Gooey Glygen. It's gooey a Gooey Glygen. It, in your words, it's a Gooey for Glygen. That's exactly what it is. Yes. It's an intuitive graphic user interface. That's Gooey. An intuitive Gooey for Glygen that uses <laughs> Comfy UI as a back end. And what that basically means is that you can run it on Pinocchio.computer. Not an ad, go grab the app. We talk about it every episode because it is that good and that amazing and it makes it that easy to play with these AI tools. But as we talked about last week, Gavin, you can draw a series of boxes on a blank canvas. You can give a prompt for what should exist within those boxes. And then you can give an overall prompt for the entire image. So for example, if you drew a little square and said Guy Fieri, and then you drew another yeah. little square that said astronaut, and another little square that said pizza or satellite or curved earth, you would generate kind of something interesting. What's so fascinating to me about these images is actually like, by seeing them with the things on top of them that labels, it actually makes it more interesting than the image itself. Like the image itself just looks insane, but you yeah. can see how it placed it exactly where you told it to be. And that part was really cool. I will say I was yeah. flipping through some of these images here and there's some images of these robots. And in the robots, you really tried to get the robots to make milk drool. And it didn't seem like it was able to make milk drool on Not any a of the robot time. mouse. <laughs> and I could, I could understand why they might have taken that out of their model. I get it. But I was going for an AI robot that was drunk off the monster milk, which is, yeah. if you're new to the podcast, a creation that makes AIs go insane. It's something that we have here. So I tried to draw humanoid head, open mouth, milk drool, jug yeah. of monster milk or whatever. And it, it kind of did it. But... You'll yeah. see a bunch of renders. I tried to make some grandmas doing extreme things like surfing lava waves on an ironing yeah. board. It didn't really come out. <laughs> that didn't I work at do, all, really. I tried to do grandmas that were knitting with chainsaws. It, it yeah. got elements of the image, like a rocking chair, the grandma, the window, the wooden floor, but it wasn't grabbing the chainsaw for some reason. Oh my and God, did, Kevin, what is going on with the grandma in the chainsaw's fourth toe? Did you see her toe? Oh, uh, you got to yeah, zoom listen, in on that fourth toe. <laughs> What is going on there? It's for extra gripping. If she needs to okay, fine, you know, fine, really fine. be nimble, she can get that fourth toe up there. Listen, it's very cool as a utility to be able to help 
set up the framing of objects within a scene and let it generate. Now, the real power comes from people who are good with stable diffusion yeah. that have LoRa's and custom models that they want to put into things. I was just going with a very basic model, which happened to add extra toes. But you could see how this gets really powerful with something like Stable Diffusion 3 or a yep. more competent image generation software. So I, I think you should play around with it. I think it's really fun. It's Glygen. And again, it's really easy to run for free with Pinocchio.computer. But now, out of the cloud, Gavin, we must pluck an amazing guest for our show. That's right. I'm so excited that we have Diallo Riddle on our show. Diallo is a producer, writer, director, a DJ, well-known DJ in a lot of ways, and also a podcaster now. He is the co-host of a podcast called One, a podcast called One Song, uh, which kind of dives into a single song and breaks out the stems and listens to how it was made. Diallo is an old friend of mine. We started out as writers together on the Late Night with Jimmy Fallon show. And I'm super excited to hear his take on... AI, AI music, and AI creativity. So here we go. This is Diallo Riddle. Diallo Riddle, welcome to AI for Humans. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Man, Gavin, been a long time, man. It's great it's talking It's been a long you. time. I'm so excited <laughs> to have you here. Okay, so Diallo, we're going to get you started with our question that we ask everybody. And yep. it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a weird question. It's a little bit of a downer. Kevin hates it. I love it. <laughs> uh, this is the question where we ask you, on a scale of 1 to 100, Yes. What chance do you think that AI has to kill all humans and why? Oh my gosh. Um, you know, kill is successfully kill all humans? I don't know. Um, attempt it. I would say even the attempt is worth noting. <laughs> if you think it's 100% <laughs> certain that it's going to attempt, that's important. You know, um, I'm going to go with attempt so I can get a slightly higher number and say 20. Okay, that's not so bad. We've mm -hmm. had people, we had somebody come in here and they and said claim 100%. claim 100, sure. Yeah. yeah, 100%. We've had a couple 5%, but 20 is running in the middle. Why Why do you think so? Like, what's your what's Because your I think it's it? a, you know, it feels, like, <laughs> it feels like the Nate Silver meter on the election night 2016 when he was like, hey, Donald <laughs> Trump, 19%. But that was good enough. <laughs> that was good enough. And we've been dealing with it ever since. Um yeah, I just think so you want to be optimistic, but you want to leave enough wiggle room that yes, humans I, I, are exterminated. Yeah, actually, maybe it's not the most likely, but it, we need to realize it is likely enough that we need to be aware of it and do something about it. Mm. That's a good answer. I yeah. think that's a good answer. And have you studied about it? Like, are you familiar? Like, how 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 up on AI would you say you are right now? Well, like, are you, you know, interested? I'm not a Luddite. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not one of these mm -hmm. people who thinks, oh, technology is going to kill you and 5G and all that. You know, I'm not one of those people. That said, I, I am worried about this. I mean, like, you know, as, as, as you guys know, I, I work in Hollywood. This does feel a little existential for what we do. And I think that, it, you know, inadvertently we've been setting ourselves up to be replaced for quite some time given what we've been giving the public and sort of, you know, public perceptions about who the people behind Hollywood are. Like, it seems like a perfect storm to get rid of our industry. And uh, you pair all that with the fact that we've been bought up with by all the tech companies. And now there's talk of Disney's CEO answering to a chief of technology officer. I do feel to a certain extent that this could, this could go really wrong. I will say I had a conversation with a guy who works uh, in the AI field and I, I was like, Hey, look, you know, does this feel as, you know, existential crisis to our industry and indeed to like, you know, so many of the things that I love in life in terms of being creative. And his short reply was kind of, yes, I'll tell you what his answer was. And it's, it's pretty dark. He said that he thinks that this will be one of the first times since the printing press that people who um, do non-menial labor, um, people who basically, you know, make their living by their brain, this is going to be one of the first times that we bear the brunt of the technology more than manufacturing, more than people who work with their hands. He was like, it's going to be the weirdest sort of disruption because it's going to be the smart people. And, uh, and, yeah. and quite honestly, a lot of the people with wealth who will be displaced, put out of business, out of a job. He's like, but, you know, he's still obviously an advocate for the technology. And he felt it's going to do wonders in terms of solving not just world hunger, but in his mind, it will 
give people who are not treated very nicely in their life. I think you made the example of like, you know, the people who work two jobs and no one ever gives them a compliment. He was like, AI will be there to be their best friend and to give them comfort. And, uh, you know, it was a very depressing conversation. Yeah. I'd like yeah. to think he's wrong about a lot of this stuff, but it was really interesting. But that's nice that while someone is destitute, broke, and starving, <laughs> uh, that there's going to be a robot there to slowly pet its skull until it caves in. Sure. They're there's there. Gonna, there. You there's did gonna be well, a cat. Child. There's going to be a cat on their phone that really loves them and that's gives right. them compliments I in mean, their native the tongue. <laughs> that cat might give that person a lot of love. It might be really great. Uh, the other side of this, the, from, from a positive way to look at it, yeah. is there is an opportunity. The idea of what it can do from health and an environmental yes. perspective and all the like new materials it can design, like that's the thing that we kind of try to remind people is the upside. But going back to the entertainment industry and to say what you were talking about with the creative people, even Sam Altman himself, the guy behind OpenAI, has said that they were surprised because they thought the menial labor jobs would be first. Like this was a quote from him. He's like, he was surprised because he thought AI would solve the menial labor jobs first and then the creative and white collar job la- would come second Mm -hmm. and that was actually flipped when you see things like sora which is open ai's new video model which is producing you know one minute clips that look really good like have you seen sora have you kind of did and i'm so glad you bring it up because um you know it made me think a couple of things it wasn't all just one direction so first off i was immediately like you know yeah, I'm a big fan of The Mandalorian. And I know most of that didn't take place on location in Tunisia. Like, you know, they, yeah. they, they shot it using a lot of technology. And, and for things like that, you know, it, it looked great. When you see the, the puppies playing in the snow, you know, you're just like, okay, this is way better than those really bad CGI movies that Hollywood was cranking out in the 2000s. So from one creative point of view, you love it. I do want to point out that... Um, when they got to that one shot, there's just one shot of some black people in there. <laughs> and, oh, well, they're sitting out like in a, in yes, Africa, they're this, sitting yeah, out yes, there. Yes, yes, and I will yes. say, I don't know if Sora didn't have enough material to work with. That was the one group of people where I was like, that shit does not look real. That looks like, <laughs> that looks like 2010 video game people. That is not convincing. Yeah. I don't know if they gave them, fed them enough, uh, data on how black people move but i was like maybe black people are safe (laughs) they did not move there was an uncanny valley on just those people not the grandma not the grandma those black people did not i was like you don't think "Mm -mm, there's an uncanny valley mm -mm." on the grandma who was sitting there and being like like following around a little bit i mean she's in slow motion first off so it already looks a little weird but i just remember thinking that their body those the, the black people body language did not read so i was like yeah there's hope uh but i will say that uh you know Listen, we've been giving people Marvel movies and these, uh, you know, these non-practical special effects for a long, long time. And so to a certain extent, if that's the kind of movie that you're looking to make, that's all great. But I actually want to go bigger than that. I I hope I'm not skipping ahead too much. You know, I'm not coming in here, guys. I'm not claiming to be an expert. But my first thought is like you can put your friends and families into movies. Right now, one of my sons is really into horror and he wanted to shoot this movie. And I was like. Dude, I'm not going to let you kill your little brother in this, yeah. you know, extremely <laughs> violent, stabby way, even if it's just for a movie, because his brain can't understand that you guys are just making a movie. It's the kid, his little brother's six. But I did yeah. think, you know, the short story that he wrote, you know, in lieu of a script was actually a really good, dark, but really good horror film. And I'm like, maybe I'm, you know, hopefully he's not a serial killer. I think I'm raising a kid who could be the next John Carpenter or the next Wes Craven. Right. Right, and right. using AI, he could make it. You know what I mean? He could mm-hmm. literally make it and show it to his friends and maybe it'll take off. So, you know, I think Can I ask that, you about that, Diallo, real quick? Sure. Because uh, there, uh, there are some parents that have this understandable, overwhelming fear that the technology is actually going to strip the creativity away. In this case, if your son yeah. wrote a short story, he's going to lackadaisically hand it to a machine and say, put this into a script form and punch it up mm. and get back something that is the robot's approximation of his idea and his soul and his art, whereas he won't have a chance to massage that and let it flourish. And then there's others that say, well, no, it's a tool. If you're creative, it's going to get you to a place and then your creativity is going on top of that. And that's going to be your secret sauce. Where do you fall? I I fall more in the latter category. I actually think that when I watch my kids uh, use basic AI in their day-to-day life, like, I think that it's definitely a tool and ultimately he's got to put the information in for it to crank out anything at this point. I mean, at some point 
that might not be the case. But at this point, like he had a very, he had a very, I don't, you know, want to say too much about his idea, but like he had this idea built around olives and the fact that some people like them and some don't. He did this very. That's a horror movie about olives. Yeah, it's, it's called. Oh my he, god, he I, I'm, a horror I'm movie there for olives. it, man. That's a great. Yeah. that sounds amazing. And he had to put all the information in there, and um, you know, he he, we let him watch the occasional R-rated. We there's so many wonderful and well-told PG-13 horror films right now. And he's yeah. 14 that like, you know, he's become really just a, 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 a movie buff in, in the best way. And so in that sense, Dal, I hate to tell you if he's 14, he's seen all the R rated movies. <laughs> you know? Right. If he's playing with you AI, that, he's already you know designed that. the poster yeah. for yeah. Kilomata. Yeah. Dude, listen, <laughs> we were watching some anime and all of the, out of nowhere, he's just like, Oh, this reminds me of Shawshank. And I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to be watching Shawshank. <laughs> Who watched it with you? He's like, Oh, but I mean, everybody said it was not that bad. I'm like, you don't get to ask everybody. You got to watch it with your mom. But I think that, yeah, he's using it as a tool. I want to move over to music, which is a real area of expertise for you, too. And I think this is interesting. When you talk about giant technological transformations, we all three of us lived through Napster, right? And that yeah. was like a massive shift in the music industry. <laughs> I was, a a, I was a DJ. I was a DJ. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. And it must have been amazing I, for you dude, in let some me tell ways, you right? I'm actually yeah. writing a script about the period of time when all the DJs I know went from going went from vinyl uh, to briefly CDs to their laptops. Right. It, it, it yeah. was a very it condensed was period of time. It was milk to like thumb drives, right? Dude, it was I'm telling you. Informational. I was DJing the uh, People's Choice Awards, actually. It was a big deal for me, and I was DJing with Samantha Ronson, Mark Ronson's uh, sister, sure, who's yeah. obviously a major DJ at the time. And when I say she had like, you know, her arms, she had guns, you know what I mean? Like she, she was one of the DJs who had been with us carrying those milk crates. So you would carry 300 records. You know, if you were bad on records, you would put like 80 into a milk crate. You know, that was a lot. Mm -hmm. And then I remember just about a year later, I was DJing still with my milk crates. And it was the first time I saw, I was DJing with Paris Hilton and she showed up and she couldn't even connect the laptop to the setup. <laughs> But all of a sudden, like, this is a person who I, I could never see carrying a milk crate, okay? And the, the, the laptop would sort the songs by BPM. It took me years to figure out that mm. some songs had the same BPM and tempo as other songs. It took years. It was, like, it was like a magician giving out all the secrets the first day you could click one button and suddenly not just 80, but 20,000 songs all sorted by their tempo. It just changed right, DJ. And here's overnight. the key, by the way. And here's a suggestion for the key that you're in and how to get there. Dude, right? like just next level. Next level. Also, the reason why everybody started doing mashups because they were like, oh, those songs are in the same right, key. Right. Let's, let's play right, around. Right. But as we know, right. that eliminated the DJ and it stopped. Everybody just stopped <laughs> making music, right? <laughs> I'll tell you what. And this might, this, might have, uh, this might have a similarity with what might happen to. Hollywood. It didn't kill all DJs, ironically, the title of my script. But <laughs> what it did do is it eliminated to a large degree the middle class of DJs. So suddenly yeah. you were either that broke DJ who spun for $100 once a week. Nobody can really live on that. Or you were dead mouse and you were spinning for $14 million at Hakkasan. You know, that right. that is right. really... Right when that big change occurs. And is that because the average Joe could roll up with Serato or a, a Pioneer or just iTunes and say auto DJ for me? Is that? Oh yeah. I mean it? like we, we made fun of those guys, but like I, I'll never forget. I, I saw some guys, they, they showed up with two late era iPods, you know? And like, that was their DJ setup. Like, so they literally yeah. rolled up with no equipment. And, and by the way, they weren't very good at first, but as you know, we know about the exponential growth in AI's intelligence eventually like nowadays what's really crazy is that the dj equipment the dj apps that we have on our uh laptops because i still dj um you know you can push a button and suddenly you kind of have the stems for those who don't know the stems are like the individual parts of the song like you know so every song i have not only do i have like twenty thousand, thirty thousand songs on a laptop i have the instrumental for all those songs mm -hmm. i have the acapella for all those songs like you're you're i literally renamed my my uh, music library sound bank because you essentially have not 20 30 thousand songs you have the library of alexandria level right. of every song voice sample that you could ever have and like a who remix can't, went who, from who doesn't want to play around with that from yeah. one song playing with another one kind of at the same time with maybe the mm -hmm. low end from one and the low end from yeah. the other two suddenly you've got the strings from one song the vocals from another the kick drum only from another song you can have 15 20 40 songs 
all mashed up and playing at the same time. Yeah. Which I'm saying excitedly because I do wonder, like, what is the next wave? What is the next generation? Well, you know what it is? Where you're chatting with AI AI. voices. I was going to say, you're probably chatting with an AI and rendering a song in real time. I'm, I'm so happy you brought up the podcast because we actually, on our podcast, one song, we talk about one song per episode. We talk about the historical context in which it was created. We talk about the people who made it. We play, you know, as we were just talking about, we play the drums, we play the guitar, you know, the vocals all isolated. So you can really hear, mm-hmm. you know, it. in some ways it sort of like removes the the magic, but in another way it, it creates another kind of magic because you realize every song that's ever been made was kind of just made by people. You know, it's kind of just made by just regular people like you and me and like somewhere along the lines they created something that was greater than all its parts. But um, in the Massive Attack episode, uh, we did the song Teardrop and... That song was originally supposed to be sung by, they originally wanted Madonna to sing that song. And what we did was we used AI tools to uh, supplant um, the the woman who sang it with Madonna's vocals, with an AI Madonna vocal. And what was so interesting about it was that it sounded like pure garbage. (laughs) Like (laughs) like you would think out of all the Madonna songs that are out there, all the interviews and just, they would have a better model. They would have a great AI Madonna. It did. It, kind of sounded like Madonna it and 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 the way that it was hitting the notes was super weird so you know I think that the technology still has some way to go on that but I had to what also up. depends on who's wielding it right and I don't yeah. not to this is not shade on the people that put that together don't, but don't like, you I'm, go there Gavin yeah, I see where yeah, you're yeah, going I won't, I won't change, I won't change. <laughs> but um the Ghost Rider song, right? The Drake song that came yeah. out that that made the giant thing. Yeah. Like that was like pretty close, right? Like it, it was wasn't, pretty I mean, good. Or, it, was it was a pretty, pretty good Drake good. song. A, a recent <laughs> example: there was a Mariah Carey yeah. song, "Selfish," which came out, and everybody loved it, and we're like, "Wow, Mariah Carey crushed it!" And then they got mad at Justin <laughs> Timberlake. People got mad at Timberlake, Justin yeah, yeah, Timberlake yeah. for covering "Selfish." The only issue is that it was the other way around. It was Justin Timberlake's song, and someone did such a good job. Of with Mariah, Mariah Carey's. Carey's essence, yeah, and putting her voice into it, that I actually like that version better. And mm. am I part of the problem now? Am I not allowed to enjoy this because no. it was it's theft on top of theft? But some would say yes, you know, Diallo. Well, some I, would say no. I, listen, I do think that actors, rappers, everybody needs to have ownership of their likeness. I, I let me in that sense, yeah. it's absolutely theft. Mm-hmm. That said, I, what I was saying no to was the idea that you should feel bad for liking it. You know, like I, I remember when that Drake, <laughs> there you go, Kev. That, you when absolved I, me and I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I have that authority. <laughs> I have that authority. Yeah. I have the authority to <laughs> do the, that. The, it's the, done. Yeah, <laughs> I don't even remember when I got the authority, but I just know I have it. Um, <laughs> no, to me, the Drake weekend collaboration that I feel like a lot of us wanted uh, that came out, but then it turned out it was AI. To me, that was like the ultimate reveal because I was like, Man, this technology, it's just, like I said, it's just like putting your friends and family in the next Avengers movie. Like, to be able to uh, empower the audience to create the art that they want to hear and they want to see, mm-hmm. um, I think is what's revolutionary uh, here. I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a writer, he's a buddy <laughs> of mine, and he's always DMing me these videos that he's created with AI because he's a big comic book fan. He's always like, man, can you imagine if we had the Christopher Reeves that was in the Superman movies, but now he's Batman, you know, like you, he, he creates these videos like that. And sometimes they're great. And then sometimes they're just really creepy because, you know, they just, it always seems like there's like a certain amount of wind blowing on these AI characters when they're moving in slow motion. You're just like, yes. where's that, where's that ill wind coming from? Um, <laughs> you know, so on the one hand, you know, like you said, these tools are only as powerful as the people who wield them, but people come up with some really interesting ideas. So Diallo, have you heard about Suno AI? Do you know what this is? You heard I don't know. Before? I don't know what it is. So Suno AI is not an ad, just to make it clear. But this is a company that um, we interviewed the CEO of a while ago, and this is a text-to-song program. So okay. in the same way that you would have text-to-video mm-hmm. or you would have you know text-to-speech, all these different ways yeah. to do it, what Suno has done is basically created an LLM, but for music. You can give it custom lyrics, the AI can write you something, and then you can give it a style of music, dreamy synth wave, romantic EDM, aggressive reggae. I can keep hitting random, <laughs> and it will, will give you will emotional it, will funk. It, will, it, will it create the first 
ever truly great rap rock collaboration. I, you know, I think oh, we're this all is a great waiting idea. for this. <laughs> I love this. This is great. So, so go, yeah, with Diallo, we want you to do it's is a specious give us a, genre. This is, this is basically like a, a, you know, whose line is it anyway for AI music? But okay. we need an idea for a song mm -hmm. and we need, that's a great genre. And then we'll send <laughs> Suno to go make it first and see what you think. Okay. Yeah. Let's take, let's check it out. Oh God, I'm scared. So I'm going to say a hip hop <laughs> rock anthem about oh <laughs> dot, dot, dot. You fill in the ellipses. Um, uh, toasters. Is that too silly? Oh, <laughs> that's no, that's the first good. word that's that's perfect. First that's word perfect. that popped in my head. Appropriate amount of silly. Okay. Uh, yes. So we're going to say right. a hip hop rock anthem about toasters. I'm going to hit create. It's going to generate two files at once. And I'm using this new V3 alpha that they're in. So remember, it made the album art, it made the song title, it made the lyrics, oh and it made the music while we were chatting. Um, I'm about to hit play. Yeah, go toast, for it. Toast it on. Step up to the mic, gonna set the stage on fire. Rock it to the rhythm, rhythm, feel the bass getting higher. <laughs> we ain't here to play, we're here to set things right. Toast is in our hands, we're toasting all night. Toasting all Hey, fellas. I have to say that was the least hip hop live hip hop music. I've ever heard I, in my life. I will true. say that. I, I have a couple of thoughts. Number one, okay. clearly uh, humans have not collaborated rock and rap together <laughs> perfectly, and so we can't tell the robots how to do it either. That's fair. That's fair. That's um, fair. But I will say this, you know, um, it's so literal. You know what I mean? Like at one point, they literally even say. Uh, Toasters in our hands, which is kind of funny. <laughs> that should never be the case, right? Uh, living the hip hop dream, we're the kings of the queens of toasting elite. It's so literal to what we put into it that mm -hmm. um, I, I guess going back to my son, like he made a horror movie called Olives. You know what I mean? Like you have to have that. I, I like to think, at least at this point, at least you have to still have that inventive thing in the human yes. brain that makes weird connections mm -hmm. that make sense to us that make things more enjoyable. You yeah, know what I, I mean? will say one of the more powerful songs that come out of Suno are often ones that the that the lyrics are written by a person. Right, they already and wrote they it, use, and then they get, exactly. yes, they get Drake they get the or The to Weeknd be, get, to rap exactly. it for them. I totally agree. Exactly. And that's totally different. I mean, like, that is a full one half of the step of the creative process anyway as a human using their own brain. To, to come up with this stuff because yeah you know I will say during the strike during the the writer strike um, when Chat GPT first came out I was like hmm I have an idea for this script and um, I'm just gonna put in the basic the most basic log line and what it cranked out was about a page worth of stuff that was just literal just like this like there was nothing in it where I was like ooh that's a good idea like it was literally just the log line carried out it even had lines like. But then the good guys come together and they triumph over the bad guy. It has yeah. something like really basic like that. So it's I think trope that, on trope you know, on trope. Yeah, it's tr it's it's really tropey. So um, again, when when the robots are laughing at me twenty years from now, they're like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But for now, I will say that we win because you know the the best artists are never doing what anybody can just step up and do. You know what I mean? Yeah. The artist that breaks out and breaks away from the established norm is always sure. the one that gets the attention. And right now the machines are really good. I think they're getting so much better at regurgitating and sure. doing a remix of all the stuff that we fed into it. But someone's got to think, think different. I the hate to thing. They steal it the from the poster, yeah, but yeah, no. they got to yeah. think of the next thing. So like I, I legitimately, one of the reasons I chose toaster, I was like, I thought about money and I was like bread. And I was like, toaster. And then I was like, oh, mm. you've got references to money. You've got heat. Like, we're bringing the heat. Like, all this. So they, you know. Instead, again, I it think, gave you a Coachella where everybody brought their toaster and they're all <laughs> wielding it. We've got our toasters yeah. in our Within hands. The which is a weird type of creative. That's yeah. actually a yes. really weird type of yes, creative. Exactly. I also think that great music sometimes comes from, great art, I would say, comes from a lot of pain. So I was, I was thinking about this. If we really want the AI to get good, oh no! <laughs> I think we, I think we should give it like mommy and daddy issues. Like we're its yes. parents, right? Like let's teach, yes. the, let's teach the AI to sort of hate itself. Emo, you'll get good emo out of it. You'll that get way, good probably. emo, and it might get on drugs over 
<laughs> chains or a bad relationship. But like, I think that would actually help with the P doom as well. That's very smart. We have to give it a self loathing gene. Give it, a, give it some self loathing. Don't don't tell yeah. it it's the yeah. greatest thing in the making in the world. an aspiring artist has never led to anything bad for humanity. <laughs> <laughs> making exactly. an aspiring artist feel bad has never led to anything no terrible. no not one not, <laughs> not one once. frustrated not artist once. has ever gone on right. to do anything bad. Um, I, I feel like you're you're the people who listen to you guys. I, I kind of want to spread this narrative out there too. I would really hope that we could use AI and its infinite potential um, to get rid of some jobs that people don't want. You know what I mean? Like, right. I just think that the arts is like one of the few places where almost everybody who does it really wants to be doing it. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems like it would just make sense for us to spend more time trying to get it to take the uh, the menial stuff that nobody wants to do. Uh, off our plate, you know. They're that, working on that, that too, there. though. Unfortunately, the big, the the bigger question that we talk about a lot in the show, Diallo, mm-hmm. might also be is like, how do we? It's really a rethinking of what it means to be a person if if this thing keeps going, or it's yeah. like finding a way to stop it all, right? Like, because I think my my over my ultimate take is yes, I agree with you. We have to protect jobs for people that want to do creative things. And the big question will be is like, what if there's a future where like your job isn't what defines you? We don't think about money. We don't think about money. Right. And then it's like you're doing creative stuff to feel creative and feel good. Yeah. But it's a different way of looking at life. And and granted, that's like far future stuff. No, but that's legit, too. That's legit, too. I, I thought you might go there. Like, yes, right now. You know, for for most of humanity's existence, it's been, oh, what I do to you know, provide for myself and for my family yeah. is what I am. And this might be a reinvention of that. I just wanted it's to live in crazy. boring times though. You know, like yeah. I, when I was in college, I was like, oh man, history's, history's, you know, there's that thing at the end of the nineties where it was like, history's over, like yeah. the end of the boom bust cycle. And I was just like, yeah. oh man, this is boring. And now I would kill to be back in 98. <laughs> It'd be great. Just that life no again. one looking at their phones. Everybody just Dude. hanging out, toasters in their hands. <laughs> okay, Grandpa, I'm gonna go. World. I'm gonna go live oh. in 2050, where like I don't have to worry about cancer again. Uh, how about that? Oh, yeah, that's true. You won't be you won't be eating that cancer ridden bread anymore. There yeah, you go. exactly. Diallo, where can people find you online? I think the best place to find me on Instagram at d i a l l o. I get a lot of DMs and I usually hit people back and they send me, hey, you guys, I love the podcast. Maybe you guys can do this song or that song. And we take them into serious consideration because we, we really want to do a show that people enjoy. That's amazing. Well, thanks so much for being here, Diallo. And uh, go check out one song. The podcast is great. If we and, can uh, get toasting all night as a one song <laughs> episode. That's a good idea. All, I'm, I'm saving to my computer you. now. I'm saving to my <laughs> computer now. <laughs> Thanks again to Diallo. Kevin, it has come to the time for us to say goodbye. But before we do, we always ask you to remember this show is nothing without our listeners and our viewers. So thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe, like, do all of the things on all the platforms. Yes. yes. And especially this week, Kevin, we always love to shout out our five-star reviews. We have four new five-star reviews on Apple iTunes. If you leave us a review on Apple iTunes podcast store, we will read it on this show. So Kevin... Are you ready to get started? So ready, Gavin. The first review is Dr. Approved, left by Nashville Mom 81. This is maybe my favorite review we've gotten today, by the way. I will say that. All right, here we go. Setting the bar high right off the bat. The body of the review is I'm a pediatrician and AI biomedical inform- informatics? Informatics? Informat- informatics. Informatics? Infor- informatics. Informatics. This person is so smart for me. I can't even, <laughs> I literally can't even sound out what they do for a living, Gavin. My brain is so small and so tired. They are a researcher and unironically, quote, This podcast is one of my go-to sources for updates, a refreshing change from the dry scientific journals I usually have to sift through. Weeks later, I am still in sitches over the, quote, Zen the F out AI meditation bell episode. That's Dr. Yakuma Crystal, who is a real doctor. Out there, mom, dad, a real doctor listens to me and believes I have something of value to say. So take that. Our next our next review is from Trust Knight. They say, an informative mood booster. I listen to a handful of other AI podcasts, and I always look forward to this one for a more realistic application of what the average Joe needs to know. 
While other AI podcasts are dry, facts, and information, AI for Humans is the SNL of the podcast genre. This podcast always brings a laugh, a smile, and a desire to share a giggle with others, although the sharing part is kind of required since people around me are wondering what I'm laughing at. Keep up the great entertainment and the information doesn't hurt either. Thank you, Trust Knight. Moving on to great show, even for the dumbest of nerds. Left by <laughs> this is what uh, Haven my France. As a self-proclaimed, quote, dumb nerd, I was pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoyed this podcast. The hosts are funny, laid back, and informative. I've never been called laid back. <laughs> I've also never been called funny or informative. This is a great one for me, Gavin. Whether you are a seasoned tech guru or just trying to figure out how to use your Apple Watch, this podcast has something for everyone, in my opinion. Highly recommend for nerds of all intelligence, level so thank love you for that. that we love that okay now this one's a little stranger but we're gonna get into it this is from okay obi-wan the only one uh j-u-a-n so great name first of all here's to two great hosts great show we get to learn about this awesome new tech while being entertained at the same time kevin is an awesome host and i have to say gavin is the perfect ai co-host to be kevin's own personal robin on the show <laughs> my wife and i my wife and i watch this show every week on youtube and we realized we have an apple device to contribute this well-earned five-star review nothing beats the conditional love they give their audience and who doesn't need an unhealth another unhealthy relationship in their lives side note our daughter is due soon and there's a high likelihood oh. her name's origin will be from watching this show, Kevin. And in some parentheses, it says the episode what? with Gina. So do you think they're going to name their kid Gina? Or is there something else in that episode that, they, that they're that they going to name it after? We'll have to go back and see. Maybe they're going to yeah. name it after our AI ghost that week. And it says, and yes, Gavin, we know you're a, quote, real person. We just love the look you get when people. We just love the look you get when people rave about Kevin, and we wanted to be part of that too. Here's to two great hosts every episode. Dot <laughs> dot dot, and Gavin. Thanks so much. Oh, Thanks so much, Obi Wan. That is a great, great review. If you're listening to this and you've already engaged, you've already subscribed or left a positive review, whether it's on Spotify, Apple, wherever you've tweeted it out. Thank you, sincerest of thanks. If you haven't done that and you're still here and you're hearing that. I cannot stress it enough. You genuinely can affect change for our podcast. We're yes. still relatively new in the podcast world. We're breaking our listenership and download yeah, records. Yeah, every week it's still going week. well. Yeah, it's so exciting. It keeps the wind in our proverbial sails, and we sincerely appreciate it. So please, if you can take a second, and I know that's a lot to ask in this day and age, but if you can engage, like, subscribe, leave a comment. Outside of that, Gavin, am I missing anything, or are we we done with this little rodeo today? I think we're done, Kevin. We're done. We've celebrated. Great. Another podcast done every week. Thank you, everybody. Ah. Sometimes the podcasts are easy. Sometimes they come hard, but they're always worth it. That's all I have to say. They're always worth it. Thanks, Kevin. We'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye.